Joe McCarthy's kind of a, he's still a culture, uh, cultural icon. And I, I don't use that word often. But if anyone is a political icon, it's him. Things changed when he, when he fell. So tell, tell, tell me about your experience watching the Army McCarthy hearings, which, you know, you couldn't get away from. No, it was there. Yeah, it was there. I mean, there were only two channels, and, and both of them were, were covering the Army McCarthy trials. Yeah. And there were no commercials. It just was just went on all day. Yeah, well, you know, uh, because of a whole bunch of things, we were tra we were becoming a, um, a total money culture, uh, which you know, money had been a useful tool. I mean, and it was there was greed and it was all that evil stuff, but. I mean, uh, we became a money culture as, as the world transitioned from the Second World War to the, the mid-60s. But McCarthy, you know, has an interesting story. Uh, the Republicans were sending people out to these different parts of the country uh, to do whatever it was, you know. And, you know, they sent him to some totally obscure place for which he was sort of offended because he thought he was worth more than this sort of obscure place. And so what he did to get attention is he started this talk about the communists infiltrating the State Department and the government, generally speaking. And that did turn into the witch hunt. You know, basically it was a witch hunt. And it was totally unfounded, not that different from the big lie. He, he got a lot of... He, he got a lot of traction with that for a long time. He destroyed a lot of lives not that dissimilar from what's going on now. You know what I remembered a lot was Roy Cohn. I mean, he had dead eyes. They were just dead eyes. Uh, and, you know. But during the hearings, there were moments when Roy Cohn surprised even me, how cynical I am. I, he, he surprised me because he showed moments of conscience. Well, they were fleeting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they were fleeting. But, but they were definitely yeah, there. Yeah. And he had made a deal with Joe Welsh about yeah. not to talk about Fred Fisher in exchange for Welch not bringing up the fact that Roy Cohn was a draft dodger. <laughs> and McCarthy betrayed betrayed that promise. Yeah. Well, he was uh, he was he was uh, a, a demagogue. He was you know uh, basically a sociopath, a psychopath, uh, egocentric. And I mean, a drunkard. He, he, and a drunkard. Uh, I don't know if you know. I'm sure you do that. Uh, Roy Cohen was one of our late president's uh, mentors. Of course. Uh, yes. And, and you can thing. see it. You can see you know where you know where. Th that sort of sort of steeped in him until it became what it became. You know what really shocked? There's a great little documentary, and I can't find it. I've been looking for. It's called Point of Order, and it's a documentary. Just saw it yesterday. Did you? Yes, it's on YouTube. It's great. It's great. <clears throat> but the thing that really struck me, because I was totally unaware of his presence back then, because there was no reason for. But Bobby Kennedy was one Bobby of. Was one of uh, Roy Cohen's, uh, you know, henchmen. Roy Cohen uh, right. was the chief counsel. Right, right. He was Kennedy on. Yeah. Worked for him. And you could see him sort of working in the background, yeah. sort of, you know, uh, running Roy's errands. Uh, I found that kind of stunning because at this point, when I when I saw it, which was um, in you know the, the late '60s, early '70s, you know, he was he was a, <laughs> he was assassinated, I believe, in 1968. Uh, so, you know, it, by that time he'd become the golden boy of, uh, of the people trying to set the world straight. That's right. And uh, he, obviously he was running for president when he was assassinated. But yeah, the Army McCarthy, but you know, he fell. You know, when that guy said, have you no shame, zoom, that's all it took, you know. I'm still waiting for someone to turn to our late president. Have you no shame? But in fact... You say, oh, absolutely not. Why would yeah, I bother with why, that? Why would I trouble myself <laughs> yeah. with, with shame? I know. Uh, you, know I, you know, there was a cartoon in Seven Days where uh, this person was spouting all of the evils uh, of uh, coming out of the hearings to a, a mega guy, mega guy, 
And the MAGA guy says, well, you know, this is no way to open a conversation. Well, it's right, but I can't, you know, what I, what I find totally unsolvable is I, I, I don't think it's possible to have a conversation. Not that, I'm not saying that this side is right or that side is right, or I'm not even making those value judgments. I'm just saying they are so counter to each other. They're so, you know, they just, there's, there's, no, there's no common ground to have a conversation. Uh, um, I mean, I think there's flaws on both sides of that argument. Um, you know, um, I, I, you know, the real problem that caused that side to be so irrational, but we are not as irrational, but somewhat irrational, is the fact that, you know, 700 billionaires uh, have control over four and a half trillion dollars, which is like half of the money in the world. That, that's not Trump's doing. I mean, he contributed. That's both sides let that happen. You know, maybe one side was promoting it and the other side was sleeping at the wheel. Uh, but it, it, it happened. And, uh, you know, if, if, I was, if I was feeling so left out, you know, I would become irrational also. Uh, I think, I think, you know, it's just like they're de it's, there's a desperation there. And they want to blame it on minorities, they want to blame it on this, they want to blame it on that. But, you know, if they really want to blame it on somebody, it's um, Bezos or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. And the, the people Soros. who, the, huh? George Soros. Yeah. It's his fault. Yeah, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's not anybody's it's fault. Hillary's it, emails. <laughs> Tell me your idea for a solution to this problem. Okay. Now this is this is I mean this is where I lose almost everybody. But uh, I have over the last 40 years made what I think is a fairly eloquent argument that proves that there is no such thing as visual certainty. Uh, and if everybody were to give up the idea that when they look out, what they're seeing is visual certainty. Uh, it might affect the way they look at their place in the general scheme of things. But in order to do that, um, they have to sort of detach themselves from everything they think they know. This, I think I mentioned before this guy named Donald Hoffman, who is a cognitive psychologist and a computational person because he got a, a degree from Berkeley and then from MIT. And he has computational proof that our knowing, what we believe that we know, what we think that we know, that we can't know what we know, uh, is basic the root problem of... Uh, and, um, um, it, it, but because we're sort of trapped by what we know, uh, we just again and again do what they call the definition of insanity. We ask the same questions and we do the same thing again and again, every time expecting a different outcome. And it's always the same crap. I mean, there's just, and there's no way to get around it than to right from the, right from the center uh, prove that uh, there is, you know, I, he also talks about perception because perception is our primary access to the world outside of ourselves. The world that's outside this body that's completely sealed off from, you know, uh, the outside. The only access we have to the outside are the senses. You know, philosophy always thinks the senses are a flawed narrative. Uh, well, you know, the senses are the only narrative, uh, and uh, so you got to go all the way back into that. But you know, for everybody to walk away from everything they know is not likely. Uh, it, and, but I, I honestly believe that it is the only solution. I mean, <laughs> you know, s sometimes I think technology. You know, because they have virtual reality and all this stuff. But, you know, I'm an old guy. I'm one of those dinosaurs that I just can't cotton. Uh, and, you know, George Wills, who's kind of conservative, uh, 
even he will say, you know, the smarter our phones get, the dumber we get, because all technology can do is give us computational information, because computers and technology is great at computational stuff. But we are not computational beings. Uh, we are beings of, of the senses, you know, and none of the senses are computational. I mean, nobody can explain what smelling is. Nobody can explain what tasting is. Nobody can explain how vibrations, you know, in the air can cause music to happen or birds singing. Uh, it's, it's, we're not computational. It's that simple. We, we don't, we don't deal with definitive information. I mean, the person. Uh, and I, I, I had a friend who said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, um, no matter what they do with artificial intelligence, that machine is never going to experience an orgasm. And he said, oh, no, they'll find a way for the machine to stimulate or simulate uh, an orgasm. And I said, well, you know, the next time you have an orgasm, I hope it's simulated. <laughs> so, I mean, it's kind of like that, you know. So anyway, technology is not the solution uh, because computational information just reinforces our knowing, you know. What uh, is the solution? The solution is to walk away from everything you believe you know, you know. Again, it starts with what I believe is understanding that there is no visual certainty out there. You know, um, there is what we think of as real, but real is an interpretation provided by a thing in our brain called the uh, default mode network. It's basically a mechanism that turns experience into like it turns perception into a cognitive perception but it's you know in the brain it's not it's just these impulses we have no real access to the actual you know the the, the physical world that's outside now our, our 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 ability to translate this stuff is you know like four thousand years of no four million years or two million of, of um, adjusting to, you know, the physical environment, you can depend your life on it. I mean, basically, it's incredible. We can jump hurdles. We can hit a ball with a stick. We can drive at 70, 000, you know, 7, 000, 70 miles an hour. We can fly to the moon. We can do all of these things because that translation that happens in the mind is virtually flawless. But the flawlessness of it makes us think that we have real access to uh, the world outside of our sealed off, completely sealed off interior sense being. So, you know, um, yeah, somehow we have to diffuse all our knowing. Um, and that's well, what we, we don't know. We just believe that we know, you know. And if, 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 you, believe, if you understand that, you know, you don't have to be knowing basically we kill each other because my knowing is better than your knowing so you know your knowing is getting in my way i'm going to attack your country and cut all your heads off you know it's just it's uh it's it's deadly it's um, and it basically causes us to believe and make us think what we think do what we do buy the crap that we buy all of that stuff it's just it's just, you know, and it's as long as that is the operative thing in the way we conduct ourselves in the planet. It, 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 we are, everybody's sort of in their psyche that they don't really acknowledge for the most part. They're scared to death because they know we're heading, you know, full speed ahead to the abyss. And they can't do anything about it because there's nothing that they know that can stop it. But, you know... What they don't know might find a way. They probably will find a way, you know, you can see. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, we're still, it's a problem. So, that's what I think. Walk away from your knowing, and it might just save your ass. There you go. <laughs>